Right. Uh, Jess Kelly is with us. Jess. Hi. Wow. Stinging Very analog. Yeah. Retro. Mm-hmm. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, very good. Um, we spoke about the VR and metaverse mm-hmm. last week. Yeah. Um, in connection with uh, CES. And then lo and behold, Sony and Manchester City have a, a deal in place. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's This is just a proof of concept, but it shows and it kind of reinforces all the points we were making last week about how this type of technology, whether you like it or loathe it, is coming to the world of sport. And the big clubs, like a lot of the big clubs, are further down the road perhaps than Man City already are. But in this video, uh, which is published by Sony, it showcases the virtual Etihad Stadium. It shows fans running around the pitch. It shows fans connecting and uh, getting further insight into what happens in some of the games. And I think it's going to appeal to the people who are nerdy about sport and want to get you know further insight and all that kind of jazz, but also the more social uh, aspect of it. I was listening to Joe on the Sunday papers and he was talking to Sinead O'Carroll and somebody else whose name escapes me about the entertainment side of games and how you know they're blasting music and they're kind of killing the art of conversation and so on. And I think Metaverse is going to provide an opportunity for fans to interact in a way that they actually want to interact rather than for being forced to listen to whatever playlist is being chosen or not being able to talk at all because the music is so loud. So I think this is kind of, it's opening a world of opportunities, but it's just, as we said last week, it's about bringing people along so they're not scared of it. Yeah, so we, we've just rolled the video there if you're uh, listening on podcast and um, it, they'll show a goal and then they'll show footage of the goal in the metaverse being scored and then you can position yourself as uh, Erling Haaland to see what the goal was like being scored. It looks a little bit to me like uh, a cartoon replay. Do you know, it, yeah. It, I don't... FIFA replay. I'm still, yeah. I'm still waiting to see the bit that takes you beyond... A FIFA replay, exactly. I, but I think that's going to that's going to come over time. But to sort of reinforce the point, the production of all of this stuff is crazy money. And if you think of the development that we've seen in recent years with having you know drone shots and all of the different angles um, of cameras placed around, and they all enhance the experience, right? Yeah, I definitely um, and like even so, like three or four years ago in the Super Bowl. The, the live cameras would be in the in the celebration after the score and now it's you see it all the time mm-hmm. but the first time you see that you're like oh, I'm on the pitch with the players this yeah. is amazing and I see the benefit of that and I see the benefit of spider cam and I see the benefit of the, the cameras this I can't envisage now that's obviously because I'm an outlet and maybe my kids are like oh die you're missing the whole point here and I might be <laughs> old man yells at cloud but I, I, well metaverse cloud yeah or else this is the 3D technology that had a massive launch a decade ago that was going to revolutionise the sporting experience and it's coming to a living room near you and it dies it, to death it was shite yeah look I think that is the fear factor but as I understand it and the stuff that I've read it would be that in years to come it won't be the cartoony version, it won't be the FIFA video game version. It will make it feel as though you are on the pitch and you'll be able to rewind and stand next to the player who's taking a penalty to kind of take in the full scale of things. And you'll be able to choose what angle you see certain things at, but it will be that realistic uh, feel. It'll be like you're on the pitch. But the issue with that is, to do that in real time. So if they were to try and do this for a match this weekend, right? Yeah. To try and do that in real time, the files would be massive and the processing would be massive. And the the jumping from, you know, behind the goal to the halfway line to whatever, it would require serious processing speeds. And I think the, the thing that I got from the Sony Manchester City proof of concept is that they had fans interacting with their phones. There was no VR headsets there at all. And I think, the approach, as I understand it, is that they're trying to give people access to better quality entertainment experiences from watching sport, regardless of, you know, if they have a 1700 euro headset or they have a 300 euro smartphone. And the level of experience that you have depends on, you know, the level of technology you have, but you won't be excluded entirely if you don't choose the VR model. But I do think it's going to be a while before we get to that sort of high-end thing where you are standing on the penalty spot with somebody and you can look all around you and all the rest. But I think that's the goal and I think it's good to see these proofs of concept to see where we could potentially end up. It, that, that's true and um, that pushes the boundaries a good bit. Mm. It, it does feel a lot like sometimes this is the tech companies deciding that this is what we want you guys to do, especially like because uh, Meta are pushing the metaverse because like 
uh, it's one individual's giant folly, mm. right? Then it can feel like, well, we're going to ram this in until you until you all love it. <laughs> Whereas actually, it's it's user generated stuff that is has in in sport in the past, like fantasy. You know, fantasy has taken over American sport and uh, fantasy football in England still absolutely massive. Yeah, like that was because it was peer to peer and people spoke about it and it kind of evolved that way as opposed to the, the league or one central power saying you're all going to do this thing, and but you're going to love it. I think that, look, you could absolutely argue that Meta is pushing the metaverse, uh, but I think if you look at the trends in how people have watched. Like Twitch, for example, people, or even Twitter, like people don't watch things just by themselves anymore. They want that communal experience. Mm. And so rather than you sitting on the couch, watching the TV with your phone in your hand, just putting out tweets and seeing what comes back, you could select who's in your virtual living room with you, or you can kind of curate your experience a little bit more. And I think that's the opportunity of it. So I think you could absolutely look at it as just a company saying, this is what we're doing. But I think it's got like loads of the stuff that we're going to talk about over the next five years is going to fail and it's going to be embarrassing and it's going to be a money drain. I think it's the stuff that comes out of that. It's the the lessons you learn from failing that I think will be the next iteration that your kids will use and that will actually make these companies money. I just think we have to go through some cringy innovations before we get to the good stuff. Yeah, I feel like, like even watching that video, like it all feels a little bit Black Mirror and dystopian now, but I guess in three or four years it's going to be just normal. Well, people would have said that though about like doing an Instagram live from your bedroom, True, yeah. which you guys did for however many years during COVID <laughs> to get your job done. So I think all technologies when they come down the track seem bonkers. Mm. and. You know, in the 10 years or so I've been talking about tech, there have been so many things that have been promised to be the next big thing and then they disappear off the face of the earth. I think we are going to have some form of virtual world and it may not be the metaverse. The metaverse could crash and burn. Like all the controversies with meta and all the rest, we don't know how they're going to pan out. Somebody is going to swoop in and create a virtual world. And I think the big mistake that any company could make is by, by making their VR world closed off so that, you know, if we wanted to talk in VR, we all had to have, say, PS5s or we all had to have Apple's VR headset or, you know, even the Quest. They, there has to be that sort of interconnectivity to ensure then that you're not leaving people who don't want to spend €1,700 Euro on a, a particular headset behind. Um, so I, I think it's just getting started. And I know some people are going to absolutely hate this notion, but... I think there will be some clubs who do it well that you, even if you don't like that football club, you would be willing to pay, say, 50 quid to have a VR experience and walk around their stadium or get into the dressing room or whatever it is. It's going to be that extra added value because we know that, you know, maybe Shane's age and younger, like the attention spans aren't there. And the ones... Thanks, Jess, thank you. Um, look, you're what did, what did you say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Turn up your hearing aid there. Um, I think, you know, it's going to be about keeping people's attention, keeping brand loyalty and making sure that there is an entertainment value. Like when I was in the US a few years ago, like years and years ago, with first time I went to Boston, we went to a basketball game and like every three minutes there were people coming out shooting T-shirts into the crowd and there were dancing mascots and it, the whole thing was a production. And I think... Other sports, particularly here in Europe, are probably looking at the US model thinking, okay, how can we keep the attention span of the younger audience who are interested in sport, but also want that entertainment value? And so it's going to be a bit of a mishmash, but you will have people saying that it takes away from the game and blah, 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 blah. But it's coming. Yeah. Okay. Um, The other thing that we wanted to talk about was uh, Netflix and um, how everybody is probably getting served games on their algorithm at the moment. Yeah, and this goes back to what we were just talking about in terms of the popularity of gaming and the fact that, you know, it's not enough just to be sitting down watching something on Netflix now. As you're scrolling through, maybe you open a game and you play a little game of that. They obviously have all the Netflix originals, so Stranger Things and so on. And what they're doing now is creating a row of games that appear. So if you're not sure what to watch and you like Stranger Things, you can go into the game for a little while and you can play. But Netflix were kind of first out of the traps with this. Now we have Paramount Plus doing it. Amazon is doing it. Um, 
I think Disney Plus is working on stuff as well. So gaming isn't this little niche thing over here anymore. Like there were stats from the UK that showed that gaming was the biggest home entertainment spend last year. People are investing their money into whether it's consoles, whether it's downloadable content for if you're playing Candy Crush, whatever it is, there's money to be made here. And we know from stats that were out last year that showed that Netflix dropped in terms of users. And there are so many players now coming out of the traps in terms of streaming services. So it's about offering that added value to the user. And I think when we see, like Amazon has done a deal with some of the PlayStation games. Amazon is not a super popular platform here, Amazon Prime. But I guarantee you there will be people who would want to play the TV-based version or the app-based version of something like God of War. So they would sign up just for access to that, which sounds like good news for us, the consumer, that we're getting more for our money. But I just think it means that prices are going to go up. And if you are, if you like certain content, you're going to have to continue to pay for each of these platforms. Like we worked it out on News Talk last year. I think it's if you want the top tier of all the streaming platforms that were there at the time, which I think was six of them, you'd be spending 1,400 euro a year just on your subscriptions for TV. If that continues to go up, a time is going to come where we're going to go, look, I have to call it. And especially then if you're paying for metaverse experiences and all the rest, it's going to get super expensive. And so I'm interested to see, you know, who leads the charge on this and what actually takes off. That's before you pay for your broadband to get it all piped mm. in. And your telly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, bonkers. Amazon Prime's uh, user interface is the best. Uh, Apple's is the worst. Uh, yeah, I, I am really lazy. I just use voice control for all of my stuff now. I just... But does it work for Apple? Like... With Apple, you've got to search every time. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, <laughs> Apple TV. Yeah, I don't spend a whole host of time on Apple TV, but any time I've used it, I usually, because again, I use the Chromecast that we spoke about last week, so I can just tell my phone to do things and then the okay. TV will do it. Uh, and also Sky Glass is great at that as well. Sky Glass is really good because the voice control thing is built into the remote and it can then scour the entire um, library of stuff that's on your telly. Sky Glass is definitely the best of the things that you're watching on it then. I find Amazon Prime is actually, for all of the crap that they get about their various terrible user interfaces on all of their platforms, yeah. their TV one is the best. Uh, the Kildare accent is so generic that you'd imagine Google and Apple and all these guys will be able to pick it up Flat. fairly easily. Flat. <laughs> Flat. A flat Athoy accent. Anything else, Jess? Uh, that's kind of it for this week. We're going to have, uh, we got a bit of insight into some of the big titles coming down the tracks over the next little while. So as soon as those titles come in, and of course we are waiting the arrival of the PSVR 2, uh, we will get to grips with that and then I'm sure have some reviews for you. And then um, we can have video of us running into um, oh, yeah. into the wall. I cannot wait. Ah. Good stuff. Uh, thanks very much. That's uh, New Stocks Jess Kelly in partnership with Virgin Media, bringing your A-game with 99.9% broadband reliability.